Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthias. I'm the uh, head of marketing of Bio Deutschland, the German Biotech Association. I'm today's host and administrator. Um, and I welcome you to this webinar in cooperation with uh, Pharma Intelligence, expanding patient pools while navigating regulatory landscape in the European market. For this topic, we have uh, three uh, speakers, uh, Edgar Fenzel from FGK Clinical Research, who will give us the first impression from his perspective on regulatory affairs, uh, with which he heads the working group in Bayer-Deutschland, and then uh, Morgan Sellers and Stephen Novak, both the experts from Pharma Intelligence. A quick uh, remark from my end, if uh, anyone from the attendees has questions, they can either hit the uh, raise your hands button or put your questions in the chat. And after the presentations, we will make a summary and uh, get to those questions. So if there's anything, just bring it up um, in both of these ways. Um, so and now I'd like to head over to Edgar Fenzel. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, I wanted to highlight a little bit uh, the work of the um, uh, working groups of Bio Deutschland. For those uh, who are not familiar with that, Bio Deutschland has around 400 uh, members, quite different one biotech companies, law firms, big farmers, uh, consulting um, um, consultants. And we have about 10 working groups. Uh, one of them is a regulatory group, and regulatory together with the working group Gesundheitspolitik, Health Policy are taking care of any aspects of uh, improving, uh, also topics like improve, improving the um, uh, field in the clinical development, patient recruitment, etc. cetera. Um, just to give you an idea, we have from the 400 mm -hmm. uh, companies in Bio-Deutschland, 54 are members in the working group regulatory. We meet two to three times a year, um, mostly in, in person, I in Berlin or in one of the uh, locations of the members. And our topic, our topics are how to improve patient recruitment, how to improve the legal background for that. So in Germany is still a brain trust for having the ideas, but when it comes to the execution of ideas, we are sometimes very slow. We had Biontech, but most of the patients who were in the trials for getting Biontech Pfizer vaccine approved were not performed in Germany. There were somewhere else. We have data protection laws, which are big obstacles. They are not harmonized between ethics committees. And the new EU guidelines for clinical studies, which will definitely be in place by next year for, um, uh, for all new studies submitted, will give us challenges which will be very hard for us. And also on the side of the patients, as well as on the side of the um, uh, physicians who might be not knowing clinical studies, we, we need a better awareness for clinical studies and incentives to participate there. And this will be the topic of today, um, enhance the trial awareness um, amongst the uh, healthcare providers and also to get patients more into studies in, with rare diseases. So overall, uh, if any one of you is not only interested to hear this, but is interested to participate in the working party, um, send an email to um, Bio Deutschland and you will be registered. Many of the people are not attending every session, but you will be on the email list of all important documents. So if there's a new guideline in Europe or a new law in Germany published, we see it up front. We can give comments. We can give input. So when we meet three times a year in the average, not one, not more than one third are uh, present, but we all get input also from people who are not present. So if anyone is interested in this topic, which we are, we'll be hearing from the two core speakers of today and what I've outlined, I hope in a very quick um, overview, um, saying, send an email to Bayer Deutschland. We are happy about every new member and just to give you a background from these 54 members, we have big pharma in like Böhringer, like Roche, like Sanofi, but we have big companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers. We have 
speak um, biotech like Morphosis, but we have also uh, companies which are just a one person consultant. So this is a very broad spectrum. And for any aspects we discuss here, we will have somewhere someone who knows the answer for that. This is one of the greatest assets for the people who are engaging themselves in the working group. And with this, I would like to hand over to the hosts of today. I'm not quite sure who will be the first speaker, whether it's Morgan or Stephen. It'll be Morgan. Yeah, I can jump on and I can share the slides as well. Um, okay. Cool, so we'll get straight through, straight to it. Matthias, could I just get a thumbs up that you could see the slides? Yeah, oh good, perfect. So yeah, thanks for everyone to, for taking the time to, to join today's session um, around expanding, expanding patient pools while navigating regulatory landscapes in the European market. Um, just as an introduction, my name is Morgan Sellers. Um, I've been working at Pharma Intelligence for six years. Uh, the initial four years was uh, working with feasibility teams to help them select sites and design studies that hopefully hit uh, their endpoints to time and budget. But, but the last two have been working more specifically with um, patient recruitment, uh, sorry, within clinical teams to help patient enrollment and retention. Um, I think today we're going to really be talking about how to avoid your sites maxing out on their patient pools before they've hit their personal expected enrollment target. But, but I'll talk to that in just a second. Um, Steve, you want to maybe uh, do your introduction? Yeah, certainly. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Novak, the Senior Director of Global Clinical Operations and oversee the clinical team that supports all of the service and the unique uh, technologies that we're going to be uh, talking about today. I lead in a, a, a very esteemed group of clinicians, and I'll be talking about those individuals here shortly. Morgan? Yeah, cheers, Steve. Um, so, so just to kick things off, I think before we progress into discussing any sort of solutions, it's imperative that we take time to just take a look at the European and German biotech space. Um, so there's a couple of numbers on the screen, but I think the first one to highlight is that um, in 2021, 107 of the 175 drugs that received their first approval um, had a presence within the European region. Uh, of those 107, 75 were, uh, the research was conducted at German research centers. The only two other countries within the European region that had um, more projects were Spain and UK, who had uh, 77 and 81, respectively. Um, and what that number shows, just at a really top level, is that um, irrespective of different regional regulatory patient and trial requirements, is that there's still a higher proportion of drugs that have been approved that didn't have any European presence. And I think one of the key things we can try and dig into today is what are some of those challenges, why um, those drugs didn't have a European presence. Um, as well as I also think the, the ongoing implementation of CTIS is a really big deal. Um, at Pharma Intelligence, we hope as it rolls out, it should offer a significant benefit to, to patients, HCPs and sponsors in regards to transparency and positive stakeholder awareness around clinical research. We think it's important that as an industry, we're all very focused on being patient first and patient centric. Um, finally, and this is a really big one, roles in operations and digital media are now on the increase in the pharma and biotech space. Um, and we'll talk through the specifics around the reason for this in a little bit. But I think simplistically, they've increased because we know patients are now more aware of what a clinical trial is. And that's simply because COVID clinical trials have been in the news coverage. So what this means is patients, caregivers, loved ones, whoever it might be, are trying to find the research that your organizations are conducting. But very rarely they find the information they're looking for or even sometimes like information that they can understand. Um, hence, there has been that increase in roles around operations and media as the pharma biotech space look to be more focused in um, on communicating to those uh, differing stakeholders. Um, I think the next aspect is just to ensure we talk a little bit more focused um, around the German market. So once again, it's a couple of numbers. So currently there are 900, over 900 currently recruiting studies at phase two and three, um, within Germany. So this means great options for patients, but also really high competition for sponsors who are looking to recruit those patients. Um, one of the big things me and Steve, Steve always ask um, our clients is, how can you as a sponsor ensure that your patient segment is aware of your clinical trial and not another sponsor's? And we're going to talk through some technologies and solutions in regards to how we can actually um, enable um, you guys to ensure that. Now, obviously, 
Germany is an extremely attractive country to run clinical research in. The associated trial costs and also the breadth of world leading universities, institutions involved in this research. I'm sure I don't need to talk to that in too much detail to everyone on the call. We know uh, that Germany is a real leader in the clinical trial space globally. Um, next slide just to talk to is, Germany is a great place to run trials, but however, most trials are still struggling to hit their enrollment goals. 49, or even though 49% of the population would be involved in clinical research, so we collected some data around this, um, and the reason that these enrollment goals aren't here is only 3% of eligible populations ever enroll in a clinical trial. And as well as that, only 0.2% of physicians who have access to those patients are actively referring patients into clinical research. Now, what are the major problems for this? You can see the one at the bottom. The first one is definitely awareness. Do those physicians know about your clinical trial? But then, and then also, do those patients or the caregiver or the family member know about your clinical trial? And then secondly, there's a real lack of infrastructure, technological infrastructure, to make the involvement easier for physician communities and also patient communities, um, which is a problem we're going to try and explain and outline how uh, we've overcame it for, for a number of different sponsors uh, in the space. Um, but I thought now it'd be really, after that background, to share a, a little bit of a story Steve has in regards to an Alzheimer's clinical trial he worked on in Germany back in 2014, um, and how maybe some of the technological advancements me and Steve work on might have helped that study. So I don't know, Steve, maybe you want to provide a little bit of context to, to that Alzheimer's project that you worked on back in 2014. Certainly. Over eight years ago, I was very fortunate to be involved in a study, an Alzheimer's study that focused on patients that were actually diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And these particular patients uh, were very, very difficult to find because we had to go to the doctors to find the patients. And a lot of times the doctors didn't know that a trial was available. Ultimately, what the trial involved, uh, it developed a, a, an Alzheimer's uh, diagnostic tool, uh, NeuroSeq, and it's a, it was approved uh, back in 2014 after a very, very extensive study. Over eight years, we recruited uh, patients in Germany primarily with several sites in the U.S. that found elderly patients primarily that had Alzheimer's. We did a baseline study. That baseline study involved gathering the initial data uh, an infusion with a fluorine 18 compound, a PET image, and then we snapped a picture of six key regions of the brain to determine uh, where we might potentially find basically neuritic beta amyloid plaque. However, it took a while before we could complete the study because the patients themselves had to, had to pass. And then we did a post-mortem autopsy to physically correlate the portions of the brain with the imaging that we had taken years before. But the critical element of the study for us from a recruitment aspect was number one, the physicians in Germany primarily, as well as in the US back over eight to 15 years ago, weren't aware of studies unless they were uh, told word of mouth by another physician, by a patient, or in some cases, some advertising. What we're finding is that through the, the tools and technologies we're gonna share with you shortly, we're able to go out and create an awareness where we can let doctors and those healthcare providers in certain areas around these studies, let them know this trial is actually ongoing. So with this Alzheimer's study, we feel that with the number of years it took to recruit the required patients, which was in excess of 250 uh, patients to gather the required data for submission, we probably could have cut that time in half if we had more doctors that were aware that the study was ongoing and they could offer their patients who were positively diagnosed at that point with DSM-4 uh, for Alzheimer's. Now, I will say this was a very good news study because after we had gathered all the data and required uh, information from the final post-mortem autopsies, in 2014, we received approval from EMA and then 30 days later, FDA. So good news story. However, what we could have done differently with the technologies and the knowledge we have today is create a critical path where we could have accelerated that timeline, save time, save money, and brought that Alzheimer's diagnostic tool to the market earlier. Subject to your questions, uh, I'll go ahead and turn this back over to Morgan. Morgan, did you have any other thoughts on that particular study? No, th thanks for sharing that. And I think it's, it's always 
really important when we're sharing numbers and data to actually connect that to a real world story. And I think that that's a really good uh, example of how modern innovative technologies and solutions could have got that treatment to patients maybe a lot quicker. And I think that's why we're all in this industry. Um, but I think one of the key things Steve kind of talked to there, and we're going to discuss this in a little bit more depth now, is, is missed opportunities. And why are there so many missed opportunities within patient education and recruitment? Why doesn't your physician know about the clinical trial that you're running when they diagnose a patient or when a patient comes for a treatment visit? Why, when a patient's diagnosed with a certain condition, can they never find out the clinical research, find out about the clinical research you're conducting by doing their own research? And maybe if they do find something, how do they really understand what you're doing? How can they get involved? And kind of, are they actually eligible to get involved? And I think what we're going to talk about today is um, specifically to how we can make that process and take advantage of those opportunities. Because I think it's a really important point. And the bottom line is it's going to be a really valuable way for you guys to, to find new patients who are not at your sites that could be involved in your clinical research to avoid trial delays. Um, so I wanted to talk about some specific reasons as to, to why they're missed, because so I think it's really important to understand the why behind some of these challenges. Um, so sponsors still expect PIs to be able to recruit the patients they need from their existing patient pools. Now, this might have worked 15 years ago, but if we look at clinical trial inclusion criteria, the number of primary endpoints, all of these different factors, clinical trials are significantly more restrictive than they used to be. So it's really important that we can go outside of that site's network. My favorite one, and me and Steve are on calls all the time with, with sponsors, it's our CRO will handle it. Uh, I say to sponsors all the time, this is your drug, this is your trial. A CRO could be working on any other number of studies. To ensure your study recruits, it's imperative that as a sponsor, you build your own recruitment strategy to support the CRO in achieving success. Um, and then finally on this one, I think it's really important to highlight that patients at your site, and I'll talk about the statistics in a second, but statistically, would be very unlikely to enroll in a clinical trial. So once the site's asked every patient at your site, or every patient at the site's been asked, would you like to enroll in a clinical trial? What's next? Are we hoping patients just come across your clinical trial randomly? Are we hoping that they're, they're doing their own research? I think the main thing around this is we need to make it easy by providing awareness and technology so that patients can find out about your study, whether it's through their doctor or directly through uh, another means um, to make them aware of your clinical trial. Now, this screen at the moment, I'd be really interested and in, hopefully if anyone's got any questions, do put them in the chat because I think we should open this up to a discussion at the end. Um, but one of the key things here is I've got some data on the screen. So we've collected this data internally. So a site when asked in a questionnaire about your study should probably outline that they have enough patients to fill the individual accrual target for that given site. However, the data we collect suggests that if a site asks 100 patients, if they would be interested in a study on a really good day, five to eight patients might actually enter screening. Um, with only, only three ever actually enrolling on the study. On the study, Now, I think it's important that admittedly we outline there are slight differences, therapy areas, types of trials, et cetera. But even if the numbers are slightly higher than the above, our data suggests that often sites will max out at about 60% of their target accrual, which causes a couple of things which you can see on the right hand side of the screen. Delays. Once that patient pool at that site has been saturated, are we just waiting for a new patient to be diagnosed or a new patient to come to that, that, that hospital? Site expansion. Now, whether that is having to open new sites because those sites are, have run out of patients or it's opening too many sites during the project kickoff, all of these things affect timelines and significantly affect budgets. Um, and I think the key thing here is we all need to be honest in regards to the, the, the current global economic space we are at, we're, we're in at the moment in the biotech and pharma space, and we know budgets are going to be tighter. 
Um, and it's imperative that we can um, forward plan to give our, the sites we've chosen in that first round the maximum chance to be successful. Um, so how do we overcome these challenges? I've given everyone lots of problems there. Um, but at Silent Connect, we think the main way is to employ innovative and reliable solutions to engage HCPs in close proximity to your sites with confirmed patients, and also engage patients, once again, in close proximity to your sites, but with key inclusionary criteria. And the innovative solutions mean Steve and I'll be discussing um, in just a second, um, put really simplistically, because I don't want to steal any Steve's thunder, he'll be taking the next slide, is first of all, how can we leverage real world data to find specific physicians in close proximity to your sites to expand the patient pools your sites have access to? And as we mentioned at the start of this webinar, we know patients are more aware of clinical trials and the good they can do. If a patient's recently been diagnosed, and maybe it's a parent or a family member, or it's maybe the patient itself, looking to find out what treatment options are, how do we make it easy for them to learn about your study and also learn about um, the actual process of engaging in that study and potentially enrolling? Um, now, I'm going to hand over to Steve to talk through um, exactly how uh, the HCP outreach campaigns would work and how we could give um, your sites access to that greater patient pool to avoid that 60% max out point. That is what we're really trying to do today. Um, so Steve, I'll hand it over to you just to talk a little bit through the, the kind of HCP uh, approach uh, we deliver. Absolutely. Absolutely, thank you, Morgan. First of all, let me explain from a general perspective, this is a, a unique approach where we are actually connecting scientific leader to scientific leader, colleague to colleague. And that's where our esteemed clinical research managers come in. The team of uh, individuals that we have that actually have the one-on-one -on -one discussions with the HCPs, which I'll talk about in just a second, have multiple years of experience. They're highly skilled, highly trained in all indications, all different phases. And collectively, our group of four clinicians has over 40 years of clinical experience. So we can talk at any level from protocol development through inclusion exclusion criteria down to what is the best top type of patient that we need for a particular study. So we're, we generally look at uh, how we're going to target these HCPs based on the, cl uh, the client or the sponsor's need. With the database that we have of over 1.7 million verified doctors, healthcare providers uh, within our database, we can focus on uh, 25 different communities, specifically in the US. So we have the most extensive database in the US and we have access to uh, very extensive databases overseas. And let me talk to you a little bit now about how that process actually works. Next slide, please. What we do very simply is we'll work with a sponsor once we identify what the clinical trial requirements are, the indication, the phase, the ultimate requirements. Is it US only? Is it gonna be global? Are there key regions that, it, that we need to really focus on? we look at what is the specific inclusion and exclusion criteria that we need to go after. Because I think everyone on this uh, webinar realizes that we can reach out to patients all day long. We can reach out to potential uh, subjects all day long, but the key is they have to successfully screen based on inclusion and exclusion criteria. They have to successfully enroll and wanna be enrolled, but most importantly, they need to complete. We need completers so we can quickly and expeditiously submit our regulatory submissions to the requisite authorities, regardless of where they are. For example, FDA in the US, EMA, Europe. So what we do is uh, approach this from a different tact. We're going to the healthcare providers that actually have patient pools that they work with in their office. They know these patients, they know their charts, they know if they would qualify for a study. So once a study is identified, I use an example, and I'll just stick with the U.S. for a minute. Let's say that if we have 10 sites that a sponsor would like to engage, uh, we will look at that site and we will geo-target uh, doctors or, health, or all healthcare providers. They could also include nurse practitioners and PAs out within, let's say our standard uh, radius is 100 miles. So we'll target 
through what we have in our database, ICD-10 codes in the US or specialties overseas outside of the US to, to actually target each particular doctor who has ever touched that patient with that diagnosis. And once we know that that uh, doctor can touch that patient with that diagnosis, whether they're family care, whether they're in, an internist, whether they're an oncologist for some type of oncology indication, we know that they're at least aware of a patient that they've treated at some point in the past. So we create a very unique content and we have on our staff esteemed individuals who develop that content with our clinicians who then will reach out to this targeted database of every single doctor within that or HCP uh, healthcare provider around that particular site to create an awareness to say, hey, we have a study that's ongoing down the street from you. Did you know about it? Let's talk about it. Let's look at that protocol. Let's look at that IE criteria determine. Do you have patients that could benefit from this novel treatment? Do you have patients in your current stand, under your current standard of care that could go to the next level and possibly find some alternative solution to their, uh, to their illness? So what we do is we do three things. First of all is we will create the content to reach out to that particular healthcare provider. That's step one, that HCP receives a trial awareness email. Then that individual through our technology will have an opportunity to click on a link called action button, even a QRC code to have uh, additional access to additional information, but most importantly to schedule a meeting with one of our clinicians. And through that, we discuss the protocol, the IE criteria, and really gain excitement. And we build this opportunity for the doctor or the healthcare provider to really become engaged in what we're doing. So one of the, one of the first three things that, that we are uh, looking for is we create that awareness, we create that discussion, we create that dialogue. Then after we have had that opportunity to speak to the doctor, two additional things may occur. That doctor says, I have patients that would truly benefit from this study. And by the way, I would like to become a PI and offer my site. And then we can go through the PSV process to bring that study in or bring that site into the study. So our awareness uh, campaigns, again, in summary, do three things. They create awareness around the sites. And typically only a small fraction of doctors are even aware that something is ongoing within their area. Number two, it gives them an opportunity to offer their patients for enhanced treatment, alternative treatment, or something beyond their current standard of care. And number three, it gives them an opportunity to become a principal investigator with the study and actually become involved in providing those life-saving and life-sparing solutions. The final note I'd like to make about this before um, I turn it back over to Morgan is what we do with this process is something that is very unique. Based upon the case study um, that I presented earlier, where in the old days, let's say 15 years ago, it was word of mouth or some nascent advertising, or maybe a patient came in and said, I heard about a trial. We're creating an awareness where now we can increase that, um, that critical path. We can actually show that we are decreasing time, enhancing our ability to bring in more qualified patients. And as a result, um, shortening the length of the study, saving time, but most importantly, getting those life-saving, life-sparing products out to the field for our patients. With that, Morgan, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, and I think really exciting and innovative technology. And I know in the, the, the European sponsors I've worked with, this is really kind of hit home in regards to it gives patients access to new treatments through a really trusted source, which is usually their doctor. And I think that's really powerful. Um, I'm going to change tact a little bit and talk a little bit more about um, opening pathways to engage patients. Now, as I mentioned at the start of this webinar, patient behavior around clinical trials has changed because of COVID. And this is really simply because the vast majority of the public have seen the good that clinical trials can do. I often ask clients, I mean, Three years ago, how many patients would have known what a phase two trial is? It's been in the news so much. People have now got an awareness of 
phases of trial and new treatment options. Now, this change in behavior um, offers a really big opportunity for the pharma and biotech industry. And we really think uh, as a vendor, um, the pharma industry should embrace it. Um, however, the typical way you may have all come across doing direct to patient awareness really needs updating. Um, I'm sure many of you have done an RFP for recruitment support before. You've put the RFP out, you may receive five to 10 responses, and then you've selected one winner who may do some sort of social media advertising, maybe have a network of doctors, or maybe even you've worked with a, a patient advocacy group directly. We at Satellite Connect think this approach is a little bit risky. If six months down the line, that approach you've selected isn't performing, what's the next step? Do you maybe go back out to tender? Do you just hope that things turn around with that current approach? We've created a different model. That means sponsors don't have to try and pick the best approach. They just pay for the one that works. And I'll explain what that means. So Silent Connect has created the world's first recruitment collective. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain what that means because it sometimes can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. So what we've created is a collective of recruitment capable organizations. We've got over 90 at the moment. And these organizations are a really broad range and a broad range of capabilities in regards to how they reach out to patients. We've got classical recruitment vendors, and I'll name a couple, Subjectwell, Patero, Clinical Connection, genetic and diagnostic screening companies, amazing in oncology studies, Genome Link, Safatol, patient advocacy groups, the mighty of educational websites, European Lung Foundation, supporting people all over Europe with lung conditions, thank, um, Digital healthcare apps, Gluco, Massive Bio, and healthcare providers, CVS in the US, Clamson's Pharmacy in the UK. Now, all of these partners have very unique outreach techniques. So I'm jumping back to the point in terms of don't select the tech, don't select the outreach technique. Don't just pick one, just pay for the one that works. So whether these partners are doing some social media advertising, maybe they're doing some education at a patient symposium, symposium or on their disease-specific educational website. Maybe they're providing push notifications to users on their apps. We've done this on a couple of diabetes studies. Or retargeting people who pick up regular medications from a pharmacy. CVS have done that for us on many projects. And um, Sightline Connect's technology allows you as the sponsor to leverage all of these outreach techniques simultaneously. And the key thing here is those partners, so all of the ones you can see on the screen, like EMIS, 83Bar, Patient Trials, Bank, Fieldscope International, whoever it might be, the ALF, Rare Patient Voice, they will only ever be remunerated, so paid, for the awareness that they've driven within their specific patient communities or within um, their specific outreach techniques when they get a qualified patient to one of your chosen sites. And we think this is really important because... You as the, when you're planning a clinical trial, very often there'll be a plan in regards to how we'll engage patients. But sometimes things change. The patient uh, pools don't maybe react as we would hope to a certain outreach technique. This gives you the ability to have a multi-pronged, multi-channel approach to making patients aware of your clinical trial. And the key thing I'll hop back to all the way through this is more patients being aware of the clinical research you're conducting is a good thing whether they choose to enroll, get involved, whatever it is, we need to make patients aware of these um, fantastic treatments that, that you, your organizations are developing. So I've talked about driving awareness through many channels, and I'm sure many of you are thinking, but won't my sites be overburdened with patients that aren't aligned to the study in any way, shape or form? The answer is no. Because of the technology, I'm gonna talk through it through on this slide. Now, once we've raised that awareness, the first step is education. We don't want patients calling sites, right? But we do need them to be able to understand what's required of them within a study. So study-specific landing pages, websites, are implemented on every one of our campaigns so a patient can understand the information they need and care about on a clinical trial. Things like, how often will I need to be at a site? What procedures will take place? Will, they, will I be reimbursed for travel, time off work? This is, information patient, this is information patients care about. And they can never find any of this on a ct.gov record. So if you don't have a landing page for, for maybe one of your studies, 
what will they do? They'll call your sites. And we know that can be a huge burden on sites in regards to answering these calls and speaking to patients who are maybe desperate for a treatment but can never actually enroll in the clinical trial. So what's the next step to, to avoid all those calls? It's engagement. We want to make any interaction a patient has with the landing page sticky. If a patient is interested, let's make it easy for them uh, easy for them to see if they can be connected to their local site. Hence, we implement online screeners. Very much to disqualify patients to major exclusionary criteria as early as possible. So whether it's comorbidities, previous treatments, lifestyle factors, smoking, for example, is often exclusionary criteria, physiological and demographic factors, weight, age, gender. Um, Having the screener allows us to ensure that if any patient is connected to your site, there isn't any major exclusionary criteria that would mean that on-site meeting with that PI or the study coordinator, whoever is conducting, the, maybe an assistant who's conducting that meeting, there isn't, there isn't going to be after the first question, sorry, we can't enroll you on the clinical trial. The third step is patient to site handoff. Once a patient has gone to the landing page, learn about the study and the requirements that uh, are um, aligned to them, they've clicked on pre-screen now, they've gone through, we typically do five to 10 questions. Um, and there's no major exclusionary factors after that. They'll then enter their zip code or postcode if you're in the UK. And our technology will find their nearest clinical trial, trial site for them. At this point, the patient will enter their contact information and sign a release consent. Now, I know we're speaking with Barry Deutschland today, so I think it's really important to mention here that this technology is completely GDPR compliant. And we're currently running and working on studies in over 44 different countries. So if there's any specific project, do let us know and we can outline specifically um, the compliance structure that we can implement to ensure that direct to patient works in those uh, given regions. Um, now once the patient agrees consent, that uh, agrees the consent form and submits, your PIs will receive an immediate alert. The way I always like to describe it is a ding in their inbox. Ding, you have an incoming patient. They'll be able to see the patient's contact information and the answers they gave in that screening process. So they can get a really good detailed understanding of is this, do we need to bring this patient into the on-site visit? Um, also, you as the sponsor, and this is really important in regards to managing any any. Um, clinical trial, you'll be able to see in the back-end analytics which of the sites those patients have been sent to. This is fantastic if you ever want to have to manage bandwidth at clinical trial sites. If you have a limited number of screening visits that can be conducted at a certain site throughout a month, you have the ability to turn sites on and off when you can see the live analytics in regards to how many patients have been screened, how many patients have been randomized, and how many patients have maybe disqualified during the on-site screening. And um, so once that patient has released the consent, the PI will then have the ability to organize that on-site visit for the patient, which really takes me on to the final point, scheduling on that visit. And this takes me back to let's be sticky. Let's make it easy for patients. Let's engage them in a way that they understand. Let's engage them in a way that makes things easy for them um, to actually get involved in clinical research. So one of the key things we want to avoid after a patient's gone through a screener, signed the release consent, enters their details, is email or phone tennis around organizing an on-site visit. Are you free at two o'clock? No, I'm free at one. I can't do one. Whatever it might be, we want to ensure that that process of selecting an on-site visit is easy for both the PI to manage their workload and the patient to actually get to that site. Hence, we implement something called the patient scheduler, which is a really simple but hugely effective way in increasing conversion rates. But really simplistically, the schedule allows each site to outline the times during the week they'd like to do on-site screening. So let's say your sites are a little bit quieter on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, whatever it might be. The patient will be able to select a time that suits them within those hours. And we know this is going to be so important in regards to diversity and inclusion on clinical trials, whether that's ethnic diversity and inclusion or economic diversity and inclusion. Because if people have commitments to, pardon me, to children or work, this allows the patient to select a time that fits their availability. The 
highly qualified and educated patients um, will go to that on-site screening at a time that fits their availability. We think that's really important. And once again, we're doing this to make things easier for patients, but also to ensure and protect the bandwidth at our clinical trial sites. We don't want them fielding lots and lots of phone calls from patients desperate to enroll in a clinical trial, but can't actually do it. So to summarize, what we're offering to, to you as sponsors and to the broader pharma and biotech industry is an ability to tap into patient pools in close proximity to your sites through many channels on a pay per performance basis. And then we're providing the technology to educate the patient to really help with retention so they know what they're getting themselves into. Screen so that if a patient ever gets to a site, they're at a high level of qualification. And then the ability to actually schedule that on-site visit that aligns with people's everyday lifestyles. Maybe they work late. Maybe they could drop the, drop the kids off at school. Whatever it is, this is a good thing to deliver for patients. And I think that's what we're trying to do throughout um, this demonstration. Um, this technology put more simplistically or I guess aligned to a bit more of a bottom line or top line benefit is all about ensuring, and this is Steve's technology as well, is all about avoiding that max out point at your sites by ensuring that you're introducing your sites to highly qualified patients outside of your existing sites patient network. Because of the data we mentioned earlier on the call, there will be a saturation point. And by implementing a recruitment strategy to find PIs and patients in close proximity to your site, you have the ability to ensure that that 60% point isn't a standard in the industry. Actually, the standard is PIs more often than not hit their individual recruitment targets. Um, next, what we're going to do, because I know we've been talking a little bit conceptually there around the, the technology and how we did, we'd, we'd apply it. Um, but Steve's going to now talk through how we supported a rare disease in Germany, a, a, um, a case study, a real life example, and to talk through how we support a rare pediatric trial recruiting globally. Um, Steve, do you maybe want to jump into to the, uh, the case study? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Morgan. If you go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, about two years ago, we launched a study uh, in Germany with a, an esteemed client in uh, cystic fibrosis. And this was really tough because we know that cystic fibrosis patients are very, very hard to find, especially in Germany at this time. We, through our extensive research, we found that there were only 15 identified patients in all of Germany with cystic fibrosis. And when you couple that with the fact that we're in the throes of the COVID pandemic and we're dealing with geographical issues, for example, if everyone knows where Essen and Frankfurt are in those uh, Western regions of Germany, uh, those are two uh, sites that were very limited geographically. And with only two sites, it even reduces the client's chance of finding qualifying patients for the study. So what was really interesting about this is using the tools I had talked about earlier, we reached out to every single doctor in Germany with a specialty that would have touched the cystic fibrosis. And it's more than just respiratory uh, specialties. It could be general practitioners, uh, internists, a number of doctors who would have uh, seen these particular patients. And through this, we, this program, we had literally reached out to over 1,676 doctors within Germany. And through that uh, campaign, we probably sent over Oh, over 5,000 emails. And out of those emails, we actually found three physicians that were interested. So what had happened during this was, a, was actually nothing short of a miracle that through our recruitment campaign, the fact that we targeted very specific doctors in Germany, the bulk of those specialties were pulmonologists, and we'd worked with organizations such as MUKU, which is you know, the German Cystic Fibrosis Association and other key physicians, we actually identified out of those uh, 15 doctors, three patients who successfully screened, enrolled, and completed the study. So basically, this process was able to move mountains for the clients to successfully enroll in a study that before they had no idea how they're going to find these patients, let alone complete the study and then submit for the regulatory approval. So the good news story here is by leveraging 
uh, three key things we're going to find that we can really move those mountains. Identifying those doctors out there that know where the patients are, and then having that scientific discussion to really go through what the parameters of that protocol and the IE criteria entail, and then building that story that, wow, we can really provide an alternative treatment for these patients beyond that normal standard of care and truly save lives. So with that, subject again to your questions, Morgan, I'll turn it back over to you for your case study. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think just in regards to, to direct to patients, I'd once again, share a, a real world story in regards to how we supported a, a sponsor within a, re I mean, we could have maybe shared a, a COVID example, but I'm sure everyone's uh, sick to death of hearing COVID examples and how amazing recruitment was in that. So we decided to share something that was really challenging, um, but I think it demonstrates really effectively the, the access to patients we have, even in really tough to treat, tough to recruit patient segments. Um, so we got asked by a, a sponsor to, to provide global support to, to a phase two congenital hyperinsulism trial. Um, some of the main things here was um, the study was really struggling to recruit. And that's because it was not only was it in a really rare condition, it was in a pediatric setting. And the compliance language and regulatory framework around doing those sorts of clinical trials is really tough. Um, and they kind of maxed out. The, the, the sites had said, we've, we've run out of patients. So what they wanted to do was open some new channels to drive awareness across the globe. But they weren't sure how to do it. We weren't sure whether to go with a standard recruitment vendor or maybe work with one of the patient advocacy groups. Luckily, I guess we caught up with them. So what we outlined to them was that by working with Sightline Connect, they didn't have to make that choice in regards to who do they work with to increase the awareness to patients that they have. Now, as I talked through at the start of the call, of course, we, well, just a second ago, of course, we implemented a study landing page. If a parent is going to enroll or be involved in a patient enrolling in a clinical, a child being enrolled in a clinical trial, we need to ensure that that parent has a really good understanding in regards to the requirements that are going to be put on that, that child. Um, so we implemented the study landing page to ensure that anyone going to a site was really educated about what's going to be required of them. The screening process to ensure that if you see on the screen on the right hand side, historically, if maybe you just had a ct.gov record, that might be 146 phone calls going to your sites. That's a hell of a lot of resource at each of your sites to try and answer those questions. What we did is by implementing the pre-screener, we meant that only 14 patients were connected to a clinical trial site. And the way in which those, kind of, those patients and the parents um, on behalf of the, those, the, those pediatric patients were made aware of is we work with nine different recruitment vendors simultaneously. And I'm sure maybe you've come, some of you guys on the call have come across rare patient voice clinical connection before, but we also work with the congenital hyperinsulism collaboration research network. These organizations have fantastic access to patients, but all reached out in a very, very different way. And what that meant was instead of maybe having a CT.gov record and having 146 calls going to your sites, it actually meant that we got 14 patients qualifying through the online screening, being connected to a clinical trial site, and then two patients actually randomized and understood it. And within a really rare condition like this, which I think was only recruiting a maximum of 32 patients, we managed to deliver two of those patients in six months. And the exact timelines in regards to the recruitment period beforehand we vastly increased the patient per site per month forecast that they expected for this study. And we think this example shows, even within a rare condition, how awareness and technology to support that awareness enables recruitment success. Um, and I think that's the big thing we, we kind of want everyone to take away from today. Um, but talking of key takeaways, I think Steve's the best man to, to maybe share that the real things you want everyone to kind of think about at the back of this call, maybe reach out to us if you've got any specific studies, but yeah, Steve, do you maybe want to wrap it up? Absolutely. Like we said, this is a good news story. Uh, we're all very, very excited about where this is going. Uh, most of us have been in this industry for many, many years, and we've seen an incredible evolution, but we've also seen a lot of challenges. The challenges 
primarily with the COVID pandemic, with the fact that technology, not only does it bring solutions, it also brings a downside where a lot of us are being spammed all the time. We're being inundated with uh, text messages and emails and all types of uh, worthless uh, communication that comes through our media channels. So we have to filter through a lot of that. So as excited as we are, we're also very pragmatic. And that's why we have a very concerted effort to really understand how our clinical trials are evolving. Let's take our lessons learned. Let's talk about how we can build those future solutions. So with those clinical trials, as they've evolved, we are also very deliberately creating new technologies that are accelerating this evolution, as you can see, as evidenced by the, the presentation this morning. And finally, we all know it's the right thing to do for our patients, because why are we in this business? We're in this business because we all have a very strong commitment to providing those life-saving and life-sparing solutions to our patients worldwide. And it takes a team. We're a part of that team, and we would love to be a part of your team. With that, Morgan, let me send it back to you and let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Yeah, sure. Um, I can't see the chat right now. M Matthias, has there been any questions posted in there, maybe? I think you're on mute, Matthias. Matthias, I think you're on mute. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 uh, I, I don't see anything in the chat, but no, there's still... one one person, Christian Fulda, is in the chat. Uh, okay. Christian, would you like to raise your question? Yes, I I need to provide him the allowance to unmute, and I've done that right now. Raise the hand. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you for spotting Edgar. Actually, the chat is technically disabled, oh, so yeah. that may be a reason why you don't see questions. Um, thanks, Morgan and Steve, for, for your presentation, which um, resonates. Um, you mentioned in passing that uh, specifically talking to BioDeutschland, where you discussed the patient tool, that it is fully GDPR compliance. Obviously, it should be GDPR compliance, whether you talk to BioDeutschland or yeah. anyone else. Um, right. But yeah. leaving that aside, what I would be very curious, it, the, 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 the HCP outreach tools are arguably super powerful, as you demonstrated in your case studies. However, uh, he, here's a question, how do you achieve GDPR compliance there? Morgan, do you want to start that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so I think I, I can maybe share with you, Christian, in regards to some of the, um, the sponsors we work with at the moment. So, so we be, have to be GDPR compliant. We work with some of the, the largest European pharma companies. Um, the GDPR compliance is usually implemented through multiple opt-ins throughout the process. Um, yeah. we, have a pre, we have a really extensive security and system and, and all of the, I'm not, really, I, I'm not a GDPR expert, but in regards to the compliance levels we have to implement to actually hold PII and to actually reach out to physicians and I guess facilitate any of those discussions, we have to ensure that everything's completely compliant because we're running projects and campaigns in Europe at the moment. Um, so yeah, we have a GDPR document I could share with you, but um, yeah, we, we, we have multiple opt-ins and everything is stored in the, the relevant um, region it would need to be in regards to whether it's PII or HCP data. And the final comment I want to make on that also is, in addition to GDPR, uh, we also are very, very, very sensitive to ethics committee issues with any of those uh, requirements, as well as in the U.S., of course, we know we have the IRB and the HIPAA requirements as well. Uh, that is always at the forefront of every discussion we have to ensure, number one, that we're doing it the right way. It's legal. It's compliant. Because we have a great message to tell. And we want to make sure that nothing will interrupt that message. Morgan? Yeah, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head. Christian, hopefully I can provide you some more details if, if you, you require me to follow up. But yeah, we need to ensure we have multiple policies and SOPs to ensure that everything is GDPR compliant. As, as you'd imagine, we wouldn't be able to operate in Europe with the, the kind of technologies we've discussed today without um, that sort of regulation background. Understood. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I checked the chat, it should run. So if you have any questions, you can either raise your hand or type in the chat. I don't know what was the issue. I just pushed out a chat note to everyone. Um, you should be able to do so. Um, do we see any further questions? Um, no raised hands. No questions in the chat. I mean, this was a lot. Um, and I, I, I uh, think it was quite a good idea of recording that one. Uh, we will share it later on with all the people uh, subscribe to the webinar and to everyone else. And I think uh, we will tag you in social media so everyone can uh, ask directly uh, any questions they uh, might think about later on. Um, is your, uh, that's, that was my question. Do we have any, uh, any contact information on you guys? Yeah, I think we can follow up with our, our LinkedIn so that anyone can add us on there um, with any email addresses. But I think that for any German-based clients, um, we can maybe share Maritz's um, details on any follow-up. Um, but Maritz is the uh, account manager for the DAC region. So any German-based clients, these, that would be the, he would be the best person to, to reach out to initially. And then obviously me and Steve would jump on and support any Absolutely. more detailed yeah. questions that might be required. But yeah, we can share our contact details as well. I'm more than happy to, to have discussions with anyone who might want to, to follow up with some, something a little bit more detailed. Okay, uh, so uh, someone used the chat to tell you guys it was an excellent presentation. Yes, thank you, Morgan. Thank, thank you, thank you, everyone. Have Thanks a great day. Bye. We're always Bye. available. Cheers.